So I would like to introduce uh, our uh, chairperson for this session, Professor Sumon Singh, who is the professor in the Department of Psychiatry, PGI Chandigarh. His key area, areas of interest are community psychiatry, non-invasive brain stimulation, general adult psychiatry, psychodermatology. He has received Bhagavad, Bhagavad Award of Indian Psychiatric Society in 2006 and Murugappan Award of Indian Psychiatric Society in 2022. He has several uh, national and international publications. So I would like to invite Professor Sumon Singh, sir, to proceed further. Hi, uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, hey, it's my uh, proud privilege to be here. I'm very thankful to the organizers for having invited me uh, as a chairperson. And it is also a pleasure to be able to introduce the speaker who is Dr. Hamid Ekhtiari, who is from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he is the secretary of the International Global uh, International Society of Addiction Medicine uh, Global Expert Network. His areas of interest are non-invasive transcranial electric magnetic stimulation with the TES, TMS, and neurocognitive interventions. Uh, he is going to be talking today about something which is uh, close to my heart, which is on... Uh, uh, neuromodulation in addiction psychiatry. Modulation techniques are gradually becoming more important and uh, uh, are being used increasingly in clinical and research settings. Uh, and uh, this is one modality of treatment which is uh, likely to become important uh, in the coming years uh, in, in the field of uh, uh, addiction and addiction medicine. Uh, so, without taking much time, I'll request uh, Dr. Hamid Bhattari to make his presentation, after which hopefully we can have some questions. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hamid Bhattari. I'm delighted to be here today. It's 5.55 a.m. here in Minneapolis early in the morning on Sunday, and I can imagine it should be afternoon time in, in India. And I mean, different time, I mean, we have people from different time zones. I'm, I'm really excited to share some of the kind of recent advances about neuromodulation addiction with you today. So let me kind of share my screen and see what we have here, okay. Can you see my screen well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Sounds very good. So, okay, today we are going to talk about uh, brain stimulation or neuromodulation for addiction medicine and psychiatry. I do not have any conflicts of interest. I have a group of colleagues and collaborators here in the University of Minnesota and at the Uruguay Institute for Brain Research. I'm really thankful of all of them because, I mean, it was not possible to, to present the things I'm gonna talk about today without their support. So uh, before starting the, the actual scientific part of the talk, uh, if I can provide you uh, with a really nice brownie like this, uh, and I ask you whether you like to eat it or not, and whether it makes you crave having a piece of chocolate, and if I ask you to provide a number from uh, zero to 100, and 100 is the kind of the really strong craving that you have for, for chocolate, can you just provide a number in the chat space and give us a sense about how much you like to have this, this piece of brownie? Let's see what the numbers that we're gonna have. 100, 40, eight, four, 100, okay. 50, zero, 100. Okay, good. So people provide different, different numbers for, for the level of craving that they have when they see something like this. And this is the case for people who are using substances and we expose them to uh, drug-related cues and we call it cue-induced craving. They can have a, a level of craving in terms of they really like to use to use substances. And over time, we try to develop different drug cues that would provide people with the contextual information about drug cues and that we show that these databases of drug cues 
could uh, get them to a level of craving. And we, we have published those Q databases, so you can easily have access to those Q databases that we, we developed. And what we can do, we can basically see how your brain responds inside an fMRI scanner when we show you drug-related cues compared to neutral cues. And if I you inside the scanner and show, I mean, a substance user who is actually using drug, if he exposes to these drug cues, this is what you are going to see. So you will see that we have activations in different parts of the brain when we make a contrast between drug cues and neutral cues. So this is what we call cue-induced brain activation. So we have specific activations in the brain when we expose people to drug-related cues. In a recent publication in JAMA Psychiatry, this has been published just a few, few days ago, uh, they showed that basically drug cues and craving that is associated with drug cues is highly related to drug use and relapse. So we know that it's an important part of basically addictive behavior. When we expose people to the drug use or when people are exposed to drug use, they start to have a level of craving and the craving could end up to drug use, which is something that we need to consider. And as you can see in their conclusion, they suggested to consider it as an important part of clinical practice when we are seeing patients with substance use disorder. But the idea of Q exposure and, and drug cues that would make people have drug craving is also related to how these cues are being presented in neural circuits inside the brain. And then the question would be, okay, if we know those brain circuits, is there any chance that we can use new technologies that we have for non-basic brain stimulation to make an intervention on those, uh, of those brain circuits? So we have right now different technologies that they can non-invasively stimulate different parts of the brain. We have TS, TMS, deep TMS. So there are different technologies that people are using. I'm gonna talk about these technologies and give you an idea about the current status of the evidence and what are the FDA approvals right now to use these technologies for addiction treatment and what are the directions that we have right now to basically promote the field and how potentially people in the, among the audience could contribute to the, to the scientific uh, production that we are making in this field. The question, the major question in terms of how, what are the targets that we need to target? What are the targets that we can basically stimulate and do the intervention with non-invasive brain stimulation technologies? This is a new paper that published, has been published a few days ago, I don't know, two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago. And it has been published in Nature Medicine. It's a major journal in the field. So what they have done in this paper, basically, I'm, I'm not sure if you have been doing kind of neurological practice, when you have stroke patients, some of the stroke patients after their stroke, if they are a smoker, they just abruptly stop their smoking behavior. Or if they, are, they have been using alcohol, they abruptly start kind of to feel that they do, not any, they do not have any interest to alcohol consumption anymore. So it seems that when they've got a stroke, some of the brain areas that are important for basically craving among those people are being affected by stroke and they do not have any craving after the, the stroke. And the question was, is there a chance that we can kind of find the areas that are important for addiction that could be affected by stroke or other brain lesions? And then based on those brain lesions, defining what are the circuits that are important for targeting to, to be targeted in neuromodulation. So that was the, the main question that they asked. As you can see here, it's kind of a lot, really interesting group of uh, colleagues and, and collaborators. I mean, Michael Fox in Harvard University, but you can see people, uh, Khaled Musavi, Sean Zedigi, Amir Abdullahi, uh, Harsha, and there are uh, few, uh, several colleagues from, I mean, and I know many of them, they are from different parts of the world, including from India, Pakistan, you know, so it's ama amazing to see the wide range of different people who are already working in this specific area of science, and there are definitely lots of potentials for others to contribute to the same to the same question and the idea is okay if you have patients that they have same symptoms in terms of they stop uh, using uh, drugs and they have brain lesions in different parts of the brain if you make an overlap between these brain regions at the end of the day we'll have some common neurotypical substrates that basically contributed to that specific symptom that all these patients are suffering from 
So this is what they did. They tried to compare those who basically stopped smoking and those who basically continue to, to smoke. And what they realized, they realized that they cannot find any overlap between all those patients, something like 60 patients in, in one database, something like 70 patients in the other database. They haven't been able to find any specific sort of uh, overlap, anatomical overlap, which was a little bit uh, disappointing to, to some extent for those people. And then they have a sort of thing, but okay, if we have patients that they have uh, kind of activations or contribution of different parts of the brain, or they have lesions in different parts of the brain that are contributing to the same symptom, there might be an idea that these areas that they do not have any overlap, they might be a part of a same network instead of having overlap together, they might be part of the same network. And if you put them in the kind of a network level understanding about the brain, we can realize that they are not, they do not have any overlap, but they are contributing to the same network. And the reason that they have seen same symptoms when we have lesion in those three kind of areas is because we are basically affecting the same network. So we need to think about these issues in a network level, not in the regional level. And they considered that in their analysis. So instead of just considering those areas, they made a network level analysis to see how they can make that happen. And yes, they found that the areas. So they found that there are specific areas that they contribute to craving behavior and drug use behavior, basically uh, among the, all those people that are being discovered by network level analysis. They collected another database. So they, they, they have the nicotine basically addiction remission map and they use it for another group of people who had alcohol use behavior and they had a stroke and they changed their alcohol, alcohol use behavior. And they showed that they can use the same map and the most important factor that would contribute to the, the, the map would be the level of alcohol use among the, the replication database. So in the second database, they found that they can basically replicate the same results among alcohol users. And the, the map that they found among alcohol users would be really close to what they have in alcohol, which is quite interesting to see those maps are similar between alcohol users and nicotine users. And then the other finding that they had, one of the technologies that right now we use for uh, brain stimulation in, in, in people with drug addiction is what we call deep TMS. And we have different coils for, for deep TMS. And there are positive findings with coil number H4, which is basically targeting the, the frontal part of the brain, and then coil H7, which is kind of stimulating mainly in the kind of the cingulate area and the kind of the, the more posterior part of the, the brain. And what they found basically, this is the map that they had in terms of it seems that the frontal polar area is an important part of the, the brain for being stimulated for. Uh, addiction. So this is what they found in lesion studies. But as you can see here, these kind of maps that they found in lesion studies is being covered by smoking and alcoholism studies that people try to find treatment for using basically brain stimulation technologies, which is really promising, which is really exciting and promising. And I should tell you that the smoking studies based on, I mean, these maps that have been done before realizing that I mean, these lesions are also having the, the same sort of uh, map, they, based on these studies, they have been successful in receiving FDA approval. The first FDA approval for using neuromodulation in addiction treatment, specifically for nicotine use disorder. And this is the study that they have done. This is the kind of the DTMS uh, machine that is being marketed in the US, and I think you can imagine it's been being marketed across the world as well. This is the study that they have done. They have done three weeks of daily uh, brain stimulation and then two weeks of just boosting sessions, one session per week. And what they have done, as you can see here, this provocation administration, it means that they have been exposing people to nicotine related cues and kind of inducing craving among them before starting the session. So that, that is a part of the protocol. So they, they need to bring up the craving and then basically modulate those networks that are important in craving, which is, which is an important part of the entire package of treatment. And what they showed, they had showed a kind of significant reduction in terms of the number of, kind of days that they have people have been smoking and the kind of the, the significant effect 
which is still at the level of what we have with barnaclin and uh, other basically approved medications for for smoking, which is a little bit kind of we still know that I mean there is an effect, but the, the size of the effect is not that that large. So we need to think about okay how we might be able to to make it more optimized and, and make the make greater effect size. So this, it seems that there are lots of really interesting things happening, but we have some other kind of brain stimulation technologies that we, people are using in the field. And there are some new advances with what we call transcranial focus ultrasound stimulation, which is another area of, of uh, brain stimulation with non-invasive brain stimulation. So one of the things that I use mainly in my lab is called transcranial electrical stimulation. And we can do that with direct current, with alternating current, with random noise. So this is what we are using right now. And this is how, how it looks like in my lab. We kind of target different brain networks and we stimulate different parts of the brain. The promise of electrical stimulation is, I mean, we can have really small devices, really inexpensive technology, something like $100, $200 for each device, which is, which is really promising. If it, is, if it can control drug craving, 4 a.m. in the morning, then you do not have access to anybody who can support you for controlling your craving, that would be a great breakthrough innovation in the field. So what we try to do, we usually kind of do this kind of a stimulation. For example, this one is among methamphetamine users. We have, we have published a few years ago, and we showed that if you put the electrodes on the kind of F3, F4, on the uh, basically uh, prefrontal cortical part, we can reduce the level of craving that people have. So this is what we have shown before. But I mean, we have been talking about kind of prefrontal cortex stimulating those areas and how that could be related to what we are showing here. The interesting thing is we have done a recent modeling study that when we put the electrodes on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or F3, F4, we are actually focusing electrical currents in the frontopolar area. So this is exactly the area that people in TMS studies and also lesion studies, they have shown that should be important to, to be targeted. So this is exactly the kind of the, the area that we are also targeting for, for stimulation, which is a really interesting, exciting thing to see how these pieces of evidence are converging to, to each other. And if I go back and show you the map that we published before for fMRI drug query activity, one thing that would be interesting that this is basically the area of frontopolar cortex that we have been discussing about. As you can see here, we have certain activation and response to drug cues in, in this area. So this is, this is an important area that we already have access because in the frontal part of the brain is the kind of front part and it's, it's pretty easy to stimulate. And even if we do some uh, connectivity between frontopolar area, we can see that this area is highly connected to amygdala. We, and we know that amygdala cortex is really important for basically processing drug-related cues. Previously, we published a paper that we showed that uh, if we kind of evaluate the level of electricity in different parts of the brain, frontopolar cortex is the area that the level of electricity would be related to the response to the treatment, which is, which is also another exciting evidence to support that, that kind of finding. But if we go, and this is an, another trial that we have done these 60 methamphetamine users. But as you can see here, people are quite different in terms of the level of responses that they have and the, 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 the level of electricity they receive inside the brain. So there is a huge interpersonal differences, which we, we need to take into account. If I go back and talk about the first non-invasive brain stimulation approval from, from FDA, it goes back to FDA approval for uh, depression uh, in 2008. And because of that, people have been able to collect huge amount of data. And people basically targeted different parts of prefrontal cortex to be able to modulate depression. So this is what people are doing right now. But the response to brain stimulation to dorsolateral brain, prefrontal brain stimulation is quite different among people with depression. And people realize that there is something like 30% of people that are, are responding, some of the people are not responding. And the question was how we can optimize the targeting. And I'm gonna talk about this to see how we can use this, these new these evidences in, in addiction as well. So this is what we have in depression. 
But one of the really interesting findings that people have shown that basically if we measure the connectivity of the areas that people are targeting for stimulating, people have been targeting different areas in the prefrontal cortex. And if we make a, a relationship between the level of clinical improvement and how these areas that are being stimulated are connected to an area that we call subgenual anterior, subgenual cingulate cortex, an area deep into the kind of, uh, anterior cingulate cortex, we call SGC, subgenual anterior cingulate cortex, subgenual kind of cingulate cortex. So you can see the, the negative correlation, how these things are negatively connected to each other the more negative connection would mean that they will have a better treatment response. So we need to find areas in the prefrontal cortex that are negatively connected to subgenual cingulate cortex, and those areas are the areas that they can basically make people to have a better outcome from, from the TMS for depression. Based on that, people have done a, a trial in, in Stanford they call it the Stanford Normal Modulation Therapy, and this has been published just a few months ago in, in February. And they showed that if they, they target for each individual, so instead of just stimulating everybody in the same site, they go and do the stimulation in, in areas that are basically negatively connected to subgenual cingulate cortex in the individual level. And if they target those areas, for one week and doing not only one session per day, but 10 sessions per day. So they basically compressed the entire brain stimulation protocol in one week, in five days. And they showed that there is a significant decrease in the level of depression for those people. And without any stimulation, they had the same result for several weeks, which is really exciting. And the effect size is huge. Something like 80% of these people are responding to that which is amazing to see how individualized stimulation is helping people to have a better response to the stimulation. This is exactly what we are going to do for, for addiction, trying to basically do individualized stimulation for, for people. And this is what we have a webinar on, on July 27th. And if you are interested, we definitely will be happy to invite you to, to that webinar, which is free for registration and we are definitely happy to, to have you as a part of that. So we are working on that new, basically new advances. Beyond those areas that we have been discussing in terms of medial prefrontal cortex and, and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, there are some other networks, like the connection between prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex. We call it frontal parietal cortex. And we think that frontal parietal cortex is also a really important network because frontal parietal cortex is inhibiting the subcortical areas, the amygdala, ventral striatum. And then with this kind of network level of stimulation, we can modulate subcortical areas. So this is another network that we try to modulate with, with some new technologies we call transcranial alternating current stimulation. And we try to optimize that in the individual level because people need to have different frequencies or different phases for the stimulation. And based on the frequency and phase of the stimulation, we can engage the network. And finding a target for each individual patient is not that much easy. So to be able to do that, we develop a, a setting to be able to do it inside the fMRI scanner. But before sending people inside the scanner, we had to test it with watermelons, just making sure that the system is working inside the scanner. As you can see here, we can just do a kind of recording from, from watermelon to see how we can do the stimulation or watermelon. As you can see, we can see the inside of the watermelon as well when we do MRI. And of course, we eat watermelon after the, the stimulation session. That's a kind of fun part of the, the session. And after watermelon, of course, the PI, the, the main kind of project investigator, should go inside the scanner and test it on, on himself as well. So that was me going inside the scanner and receive the stimulation. And two brilliant uh, postdoc and PhD students, Aki and Benny, they have been contributing to that. Aki is from Japan, Benny from Asia, so the kind of a, the wide range of different colleagues that are contributing to that. Uh, we developed the protocol, some, some technical details, I'm not gonna discuss all the technical details, but we published a protocol paper about that and you can find the protocol paper. So 
I mean, we, we uh, provided all those technical details. And another kind of recent work that we showed how to optimize that at the individual level. So we are getting to a level to be able to do this stimulation with, with uh, in an individual level inside the scanner, even optimize that inside the scanner. And that is something that people are working on right now. But just to wrap up and conclude what we have been discussing about, we have recently done a systematic review of the, all the studies with non-invasive brain stimulation for addiction with uh, Afra and Ghazale who are working in my lab. And they basically found 104 studies with TMS, 67 studies with electrical stimulation uh, till end of April uh, 2022. As you can see here, the number of these trials is increasing. These are the TMS trials or the TS trials, and the number is, is increasing over time, and people are, people are working on that. And among those 171 studies, 125 of them are focused to craving, because craving is a really important outcome measure. But there are studies that are working on drug use, uh, negative balance, trying to, to modulate those things. As you can hear, see here, there are studies that they have several craving measures. So they, I mean, the number would end up something like 160 compared to 125. But people are considering drug craving as an important target. People are targeting different parts of the brain, so they are looking for different, different targets that could be important. And the intervention is happening in different levels of recovery. For example, for nicotine users, there are studies that they basically start the stimulation before the actual uh, treatment. So they just do it pre-treatment to just make people ready for the treatment. Or for things like, like alcohol, people might be during detoxification or even might be during the recovery after detoxification. So people could receive non-invasive brain stimulation different uh, treatment status. And I really love this, this, this figure because it shows that how different countries are, are contributing to these, uh, these trials that we have been discussing about. Uh, you can imagine the kind of USA is, is the leading country, but we have people from China, Brazil, Iran, Italy, India, Germany, uh, that are contributing to this uh, basically pool of studies. And that was the reason that we made an international network of TS TMS trials for addiction medicine. And we have some webinars, regular meetings, uh, we, and we have a YouTube channel, we have a, a Telegram uh, and also a Twitter channel at that people who are interested, they can join us. Just last slides, as you can imagine, having MRI and brain stimulation, I mean, the, these are gonna change the future of addiction medicine, psychiatry. Those who are interested to have more details, this is one of the papers that we have published discussing about all those technical details. If you are interested to know more about non-invasive brain stimulation, this is a, a basic paper for those who are interested to have a kind of basic introduction. We have a two uh, volume textbook on neuroscience for addiction medicine discussing about all these technologies and new advancements. And it's also important to talk about these things with your patients in terms of how brain is involved in addiction. And this is a kind of series of posters that we develop, and we have them in different languages. We have them in Hindi. We have also have them. Uh, sorry, let me just go back to my slides. Okay, and we have them in Canada, so we have them in different languages as well. Just last take-home notes: we discussed that uh, non-invasive brain stimulation is is important in the field. We discussed about cue-induced craving. We discuss about growing body of evidence. What are the targets for non-invasive brain stimulation? Large inter-individual variabilities, structural functional MRI to inform brain stimulation parameters. There are definitely potentials for international collaborations, and also it's important to educate patients what we are actually doing. And there are some uh, collaborative consortiums that you can join. And that is my last slide. Thank you, my collaborators, and you can find my email if you want to send me an email and if there is anything that I can help you for. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kyari. Uh, I think it was a very nice talk. Uh, I think it's important uh, for the audience to sort of appreciate that the whole idea of non-invasive brain stimulation in addiction medicine is all about treating addiction as a brain disease uh, and using, you know, uh, the different parts of the brain and the connection and how it is a kind of a bioelectric organ uh, to sort of uh, modulate uh, the processes that kind of 
uh, you know, are involved in the whole process of addiction. Uh, I think it's, it was also important to sort of appreciate that Dr. Ekhtiari was able to sort of cover in his talk, uh, you know, different modalities, uh, the whole whole field of individualized uh, neuromodulation, which is coming up uh, over the past few years, which was, I mean, you see the earlier studies, they were mostly about one size fits all sort of modalities, but now it's more about individualized treatments. Because as we've seen across uh, you know the world and across different neuromodulation studies, it does seem that uh, there is a huge amount of variability in the kind of results that we see. And individualization of treatment may be an important facet of uh, where we may be going wrong. And also uh, different phases of treatment. So uh, I think it was a very good talk. Uh, there was a lot of area that was covered and uh, maybe uh, a little uh, complicated and uh, too broad based, but but wonderful. I, I really enjoyed the talk. So I think there are some questions that we could take. Uh, so there is one question with regards to TDCS and neurofeedback. How effective do you think it is? So Dr. Kerry, would you please uh, take this question? Please. Yep, I can see. It. I'm I'm just kind of seeing the the questions that we have in terms of how we might be able to. Uh, to combine them together. And this is how addiction neuroscience is moving forward in terms of giving us a sense of that, okay, how CBT is working, how contingency-based management is working, how all different psychosocial interventions that I'm not, I'm sure Paul is going to talk about those things, how these sort of kind of psychosocial interventions are, are working. And and how modulations are working and how medications are working. And then the idea is if we know how these kind of uh, types of interventions are working and how what are the targets that we are engaging, then we can use synergistic effects of those things together to boost up the treatment services that we are providing. And that is the promise of, of addiction neuroscience in terms of giving us a, a good understanding about how these different versions of treatment and these things are working together. So, I mean, I, even when we have, I was talking about uh, neuromodulation trial, you always see that there are some psychosocial components to those trials. So we are not just doing a stimulation. We are doing a stimulation in context of a psychosocial intervention, and then we provide people with, with medication. So it's a combination of everything together. And the question is how we can optimally, optimally kind of merge these things together. So we are not supposed to just say, okay, I'm a neuromodulation guy. I'm just going to stimulate people without thinking about what are the things that are happening on, in, in the context of the stimulation. So it's going to be important. And that is kind of the, the same issue with, with neurofeedback and, and brain stimulation. And I can see that there are people asking about low frequency RTMS or CTBS or cathodal TBS because in, in neuromodulation, we can have a stimulatory interventions and uh, inhibitory stimulation and low frequency uh, TMS or CTBS or cathodal TDCS, there are inhibitory modulations. It seems that we are still not 100% sure in terms of whether, for example, cathodal stimulation is really inhibitory or it's, it's going to be a stimulatory. But even in the map that Michael Fox and his team de developed in, in nature medicine, you can see that they are suggesting some areas to be stimulated and some areas to be suppressed. And frontopolar area is one of the areas that they suggest to be basically uh, stimulated and some areas in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or probably in the inferior frontal gyros to be suppressed. So there are still discussions in terms of how these things are actually working. And I'm not 100% sure that even CTBS, so this is a discussion that I had with Colin Handel, who is mainly doing CTBS, in terms of whether it's just really doing the kind of the uh, inhibitory part or it also stimulates the, the brain. So there are still some discussions in terms of what should be done in terms of the stimulation or inhibition of those areas. But we know that when we put electricity on those areas, we can modulate the the brain response to our crew, which is, which is really exciting. And it seems that that is going to be the, the future direction for making that happen. And I can see here that uh, one of my colleagues basically shared some of the 
the kind of the videos and 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 papers. So you can find those things, and you can just I mean, Google and find those 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 areas. So and I will be definitely happy to to help uh, people. And I have been in touch with with colleagues in uh, all India Institute of Medicine, and I think that they are doing an absolutely brilliant job. So I think that I, some of the kind of the most uh, kind of brilliant people in the field are, are from India, and I'm hopeful that we will still have some other brilliant colleagues from India to basically push this area forward. Okay, so there's one more question. Uh, do the neuroanatomical targets of stimulation and non-invasive brain stimulation vary across sub substances being abused? That's a really good question. It seems that at least so far, we know that there is a significant level of consistency across different substances, which is promising. Even in, in uh, Michael Fox's paper in Nature Medicine, as I have mentioned, they showed that they can replicate the results that they develop in nicotine users, in alcohol users. So it seems that there is significant uh, consistency across different populations of substance use disorder. And this is what we are seeing also in our fMRI studies. I think that I think the, the major differences that we have is among the individuals. So within nicotine users, we have a significant variation. Within alcohol users, we have significant and we need to consider those within population variations in the treatment. And I think that anybody who has done kind of clinical practice in addiction medicine, we know that people are really different. And this is how we, we try to address these individual differences in our treatment, whether it's a psychosocial treatment, whether it's kind of neuromodulation, or even in pharmacological interventions. Okay, uh, so I guess there are no more questions. So I think, Naresh, we can uh, stop this session here. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. It was uh, very nice and we, I, I personally enjoyed the talk very much. And hopefully we can sort of get in touch later. I'm sure uh, anybody with any pending or any lingering doubts can get in touch with him. And uh, uh, I'm sure you'll be glad to respond to them. Thank you very much. And thank you, Naresh. And thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful session. So, Department of Psychiatry in Jodhpur, I, Dr. Navratan, giving this vote of thanks in place of Dr. Preeti K, who is the organizing secretary for this CME, who has done lots of hard work to make this CME successful, but he is not available at this moment because of some other academic engagement. So, first and foremost, I would like to thank our beloved director, sir, Professor Sanjeev Misra. Dean Academics Professor Gudeep Singh sir for their guidance and support to organize such an enlightening program. I would like to thank our HOD Dr. Nalesh Nevingani who is a constant support for us and guided us at every steps. I would like to thank all the respected chairpersons for chairing the sessions and to give precious time for the CME specifically on Sunday. So I would like to thank Professor P.K. Dalal sir, Dr. Ravindra Rao sir, Professor Rakesh Kumar Chadda sir, Professor Sukhman Singh sir, Professor Mahendra P. Sarma sir. I would like to thank all the wonderful esteemed speakers who teach on various topics on recent advances in psychiatry, specifically on addiction psychiatry. So thank you Professor Atul Ambekar sir, Dr. Shalini Arunugiri ma'am, Professor Devasis Basu sir, Dr. Hamid Akhiari and Dr. Paul Grant. I'd like to thank all the organizing team. So thank you, Naresh sir, including all the organizing team, uh, Mukesh sir, Dr. Preeti, Pratibha ma'am, Dr. Anish, Dr. Tanu, Ms. Lakshmi, today's MC, Dr. Puneet, Dr. Pranshu, Dr. Surbi, Dr. Surendra, and all the residents and staff of the Department of Psychiatry. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants from the various countries for their enthusiastic response and interaction with us. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.